I'm Swamitra. I'm the CTO of UXagon. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about my journey in security and AI. Uh, I started doing this at Carnegie Mellon in like you know, 2000, 2002. I worked at CERT at the same time. So AI or ML was in its infancy back then. We had SVMs and a regression, LR, things like that. And over time, I've seen this field progress. I worked at different companies looking at how we can make this technology effective and practical to use in real-time defense. And Ali worked with me at Qualcomm. We worked there for a long time looking at how to apply security and machine learning techniques on cell phones, IoT, automotive chips, and doing things on not just the typical stuff you see from machine learning, computer vision, speech, you know, those kinds of applications, but looking at really how do you look at networking information, how do you look at 4G, 5G protocol transactions, and try to, in real time, figure out uh, when something is anomalous or, or bad in this, in this traffic. So that's been our journey so far. Uh, and in Blue Hexagon, we're sort of applying this technology to real-time defense at entry points to an organization. They could be cloud VPCs. They could be your on-prem, you know, where your firewalls come in. They could be email. Anywhere where people can access uh, enterprises is where we sit and do detection. Before I begin, you know, I just want to set the stage of, you know, what are the attacks that are how we think about attacks uh, in terms of categories of attacks that happen in the wild, uh, and what attack kill chains really look like, uh, what's happening over time as these attacks have progress, what automation is happening in these attacks, and then I'll go through you know, how we think about how we should defend against these kinds of new automated attacks that we see. Overall, you know, attacks that happen both on your cloud, on-prem, on email, all the places where enterprises do business, they sort of fall into five big categories. The first one of these is essentially malware. Malware is any piece of code that can come into your system and execute and do something that you're not aware of. And this can lead to escalation, ex uh, exploitation, exfiltration of data, and so on and so forth. This applies to all kinds of platforms, Linux, Windows, mobile. And these are basically pieces of code that can come in and exploit your environment. The second bit are web-based attacks. So you get a link. Sometimes someone wants you to click a link. It takes you to a web page that looks sort of normal, but it's really executing some bad code in the background. So these are sort of like enticing you to go to a website, which will then execute an attack on your system. So both of these attacks actually uh, affect a user. So there's a user sitting on a computer, and he's being incited to do something. And that's what leads to the attack. A third class of attack is on workloads. So when your workloads running in your, your cloud or your on-prem data, on, on data centers, you're running applications uh, with REST endpoints, and people are going to try to see what they can get in when they try to access those endpoints. And these are things like you know, uh, the typical things you'll see at a WAF or SQL injection, or just trying to find those places where they can send a bad input to then exploit your system. So I would classify these as more workload. There's no humans involved. These are servers that are running in a cloud VPC or on-prem. And we are basically having open access and trying to get into them. Another big vector is phishing. And phishing is pretty interesting because it's sort of the primary way that you get humans to be involved in an attack. You send them an email that sounds pretty legitimate. It'll either have a link or it'll have an attachment, which will then lead to some malware coming in. And that malware will then do something bad uh, to your system. All these things are sort of interconnected. It's not that they happen in isolation. Most attacks, as I'll show you in the next slides, will have some combination of these techniques to execute the full intent that they want to do. And the fifth big category is DDoS, where you have some services up and you use you know, botnets on IoT devices or other methods to sort of send a lot of traffic and bring down a service. What is interesting about all of these is that you know, we all know these exist, but there's a lot of AI automation happening in creating these attacks now. So if you look at phishing, people are looking at uh, traces of how good emails look like, how to make it sound uh, reasonable to the user who's getting it. They look at their social media profiles, they see how they communicate, and they try to craft uh, text that looks reasonable for the person that is the real email, and they'll click on it. So there's AI being used for phishing. There's a lot of AI being used for uh, the web-based attacks. There's a lot of AI-based fuzzing now, where you can actually systematically exploit applications. You, know, you can find uh, vulnerabilities sort of systematically in any piece of code. Before, this used to be very you know, static analysis and lots of you know, humans looking at it. Now there are, there are ways to sort of uh, systematically look at all the pieces, paths you can execute and find the place where you can attack the system. Even in malware, we see a lot of this happening. Uh, on a daily basis at Blue Hexagon, we see a million new samples that have never been seen before coming out in the wild. So every day there's a million new things. And if you look at existing defenses, they need to learn about the million new things so they have a signature to block them which is almost impossible. And that's why you see all these breaches happening 
So if you look at all of these attacks, these are all techniques, but if you look at the actual attack, they all follow the same anatomy. This is a well-known cyber kill chain uh, from Lockheed Martin, and any attack that you typically see, you can sort of map into these stages. So generally, these, these things start from a prep stage on the top, that's stage one and two, where you know, a hacker or a hacking group is sort of scoping out the environment, looking at you know, what's this system like, what do I need to, how do I get in, sort of preparing for it. And this can take hours to months, depending on the nature of the attacker. Uh, so in our previous roles at Qualcomm, we used to have you know, 5G IP. There's a lot of people attacking us. And you know, we used to have really targeted attacks that you'll not see anywhere else you know, in the world. You can't look at threat intelligence. You'll actually only see it attacking you. So a lot of prep time goes in making these attacks. Once someone has made an attack, usually you'll have stage three, four, and five, which is essentially sending the attack in, uh, exploiting the system, and then installing yourself so you can do further things in the future. What is interesting is I call these three stages sort of intrusion. And one thing to note here is the timeline. So you have a lot of time prepping, but the actual intrusion happens in seconds. And there are lots of statistics around this from different companies where the actual act of intrusion can be over in seconds. And that's the reason why you see a lot of breaches. You know, this intrusion always happens. No one can predict you know, what the attack is going to look like. And so everyone really has to hunt for it after the attack has happened. So once the attack has happened, the intrusion has happened, I have something on your system, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem, then I'm going to start looking at my command and control. I'm going to call back home, get instructions, what do I do next, and then actually do the bad activity I want to do. I'll move laterally, or I'll exfil data outside, depending on what the intent of the attacker is. So what we see in the industry right now, there's a lot of machine learning happening on stage six and seven. So let's say I have a tons of logs. I have my firewall logs. I have my VPC flow logs. I have my endpoint logs. I collect all of them somewhere into a nice sim, and I do all kinds of you know, queries on it, try to find correlations. And these are very important and very effective. But the problem is these happen after the fact. Right? At this point, you don't know at what stage the attack has uh, been to and how much it's spread. And that's why you see all these breaches happening and people can't keep up with the attacks because of this exact problem. There's no real technique to handle the intrusion that happens in seconds, especially when these intrusions are made with AI themselves. They always look new and no one has seen them before. And that's the problem we're trying to solve. Can we not, you know, instead of applying machine learning here, which a lot of companies are doing, a lot of people are doing there, what can we do that's real time, that can be done in a few seconds, and actually be effective without having false positives and false negatives. That's sort of the goal of uh, what we're talking about. To give you some examples, so this is sort of you know, an, a theoretical cyber kill chain. I just want to give you some examples of what this looks like in practice. So these are some, you know, this is an attack we see very commonly on financial and insurance kind of you know, uh, sectors, where you'll have like an email coming in saying invoice or please click customer wants something, something with urgency where people want to you know, click on something. And that click could be a link. It could be a bit.ly link, so you don't know where it's going to. It could be an attachment saying, here's your invoice. And there's enough people in every company who need to get work done. And for them, not clicking and getting this invoice done can you know, cost them their job. So that's what these guys rely on. They'll have this urgency in the email, uh, which will send down a document. The document might contain some scripting code. It could be obfuscated. That will then go and fetch some other payload, which could be an executable or some other form of code that can run on a device. And then you know, you're arrested on the system. Once you're there, you can then keep downloading other kinds of code for doing different things. Depend, you'll sort of figure out what kind of system am I on, what version is it, what exploit can I use, and go, go on and uh, on in, into the attack chain. And this is something we see every day. So we've been tracking this particular family called Emotet. It's a pretty famous family. Uh, they change every week their tactics. So every week they'll change the kind of document they send. They'll change all their servers and domains. They're going to change where this is coming from. So it's pretty hard to keep track of having a signature to say that some, you know, this is emoted and I should stop it. So this is one kind of attack you see. And what is interesting, I call it mass, which is sort of malware as a service. So emoted now, many of these guys are actually making their malware and selling it as a service to other hackers saying, okay, I'll take your bad stuff and then distribute it for you. You pay me a cut or whatever you want. So many of these guys have their own marketplace of figuring out you know, how these attacks should be staged, which is pretty interesting. Another interesting example is this is a ransomware that comes in again via email. Instead of a document, it's an Excel sheet. You know, this is, you know, here's my financials for this week. Can you review it? You click on it. It actually gets a Super Mario sort of picture. It's very interesting. And the picture, you can't say anything you know, by the picture. It's just a JPEG. But there's actually PowerShell in the Excel file that will take out pixels from the JPEG and make code out of it. 
right? So it's heavily obfuscated, and parts of the images have pieces of code in them which you can't tell, right? Which the document is going to extract. So if you look at a system looking at this, oh, someone downloaded a picture, right? It's hard to say that something bad is happening here. And once that picture comes in, the code that's in the Super Mario will go and get another executable, which is also going to be something new that that's not been seen before. And so these are the kind of attacks uh, that can that are happening with sort of these targeted uh, people who are doing this. And these two examples are sort of you know a user getting exploited, but the same thing can happen on the server side. There's no difference. You know, it's it's a machine, it's Linux, it's Windows. You know, it's a it's either a human behind it or it's a server just running on its own. What happens in servers here? These are these examples that happened on. Energy companies, you know, they have web servers running. Somebody's going to find a web shell in there, right? The web shell will come in. Over time, it's going to download another payload, which will try to dump passwords from memory, and then it's going to try to spread laterally into the cloud VPC. Sometimes these guys can be, you know, the first web shell here, the HTML you see here, is really, really simple, so you can't say it's bad. It's then going to get the next one, which is sort of gives you a nice menu to the attacker, which, which can then say, hey, do this, do that. So it's like a nice menu where you can then do your attacks uh, into, the, into the cloud VPC. So the whole point here that I'm trying to make is the attacks are so complex and keep changing that it's very hard to make a signature or know what they're going to be. So the main thing we are trying to solve is, can you just look at any of these things and infer that it's bad by looking at the code directly without knowing that a human has marked it bad? Right? And that's what we use our deep learning for. So what's happening now is all of these things that you see it's all being automated. So there's four new malware variants created every second currently. Right? So any of these files that you have here, the executable, the HTMLs, you know, there's automated systems creating these objects you know, for a second. In general, it takes 83 seconds to compromise any system. So when I talked about the intrusion part, you get in and you compromise, it typically takes 83 seconds. And when I talk to CISOs and other security practitioners, the, the metrics that report to their board is usually how many days is the dwell time of a threat. And it's typically, hey, it went down from 99 days to 80 days. So we're talking about days where threats are living in the enterprise and figuring out what to do. And the whole point of this is, this is happening because at the point of intrusion, no one knows what to do because you know, they're all mutating and coming in really fast. What do people do right now? Right? So if you look at the current defenses at the edges, you have either IPSs firewalls or web application firewalls. All these systems, generally what they do is, they have known threat signatures. So they have a nice, huge list of known bad attacks, and they've optimized their chipsets to you know, match against everything. So I see an HTML, I match against a million different hashes and see, oh, is it one, is it bad, is it bad, is it bad? And the problem with that is it only works if you already know about the threat. right? So if you know the threat, you can stop it. What happens when you don't know about the threat? So when you don't know about the threat, it goes to some kind of a sandbox, which where you execute the, you know, the threat and you see what it's doing. Typically, the threats are very evasive, so they know they're in a sandbox, they're going to check, is it a VM? Is it, is it something abnormal? I'm not going to execute my bad stuff. So it's very hard to make them do bad things in an unreal environment. They're very careful about executing their bad behavior. And even if you do execute it, which is the dynamic analysis, you then need to send it to a human threat researcher who's going to look at what it is, what it can do. It's then going to create a signature, which is some regex on that threat. And that regex then needs to be fed back to all the firewalls and IPS and WAFs. So this whole cycle typically takes you know, 24 hours, usually, at the best, right? Because this is a pretty long uh, process. And as I told you, there's one million a day. So it's very hard to scale this thing with humans to understand what, you know, how to figure out new threats. So what we're sort of saying, uh, the thesis of starting this company was, what can we do in real time? Not what can we do after 24 hours by looking at logs and figuring out what's bad. What's the best we can do when we see something coming through in one second? So the goal we set for ourselves as a company is, we have a budget of one second. We're seeing something coming through. What's the best decision you can make in a second? Because anything more than that, you're delaying the user experience, you're slowing things down, and you can always get better with time, right? In my, the way I think about it is, in 24 hours, everyone is 99%. If you have 24 hours, you can put humans on it, they can figure it out. But the problem is you don't have 24 hours, and you know, there's billion you know, gigabits of stuff coming in, and how do you make decisions in real time? And so we think that the solution to do this is deep learning. It gives us both speed and accuracy. The reason why this works now, and like I told you, I've been looking at this for you know, a long, long time, and it didn't work before. The reason was because there's not enough data, there's not enough compute. The models we make now, I think it would have taken us three years to make the model like five years ago. So we use hundreds and hundreds of GPUs on Amazon to train these kinds of models, and we couldn't, it's just not practical to do it before. There was not enough thread data that we could feed to these engines to learn these kinds of things. 
So one of the key things people talk about is, you know, there's deep learning, there's machine learning, there's AI, there's all these terms, and Ali will talk about that more. But the key thing I want you to take away is, you know, the difference between machine learning, classical, and deep learning is that usually in the machine learning, there's a feature extraction phase involved where a human expert will decide what to observe from something and give those observations to machine learning to figure out the rules or thresholds around those observations. What happens with that is you have a human in the loop who could be biased, who could say, hey, you know, I have these API calls, they tend to be bad. So it's gonna choose what to look for, and the machine learning is limited to what it can look at. Instead, what we do is we try to curate the data. So we move the human from figuring out the features to actually curating the data to make it make sure, you know, cleanly label what's good and bad, what kind of bad is it, and let the deep learning take the large spectrum of observations and try to figure out the high-level features. And that's what gives uh, deep learning the power to be generalizable. So given some test data, some training data, it can generalize into the future better than the classical machine learning. The second thing it can do is it is much more robust to small perturbations. So I can take an attack, I can mutate it a little bit. Because deep learning can form a nonlinear sort of uh, decision boundary, it's much better able to find, take new inputs and figure out what it is. So based on this, this deep learning engine, what we do is we actually deploy a software, which could be an appliance on your cloud parameter, which basically looks at peak, you know, traffic coming in in real time at 10 gigabits and makes decisions in real time. So it's very similar to what you would, you know, our software looks very much like a self-driving car software. You know, there's a lot of compute and GPU and inference happening. So instead of looking at images and deciding what it is, we're looking at packet data and deciding what is bad and good. And it's a sort of the same kind of a problem, except that it's on the sort of the physical, it's not in the physical world, it's in the digital world. And what we do is, we don't use sandboxing, we don't use signatures because those won't scale. We also don't do anomaly detection. So we don't say, this is your baseline and now you're different and that's why you're bad. The problem with anomaly sometimes tends to be that it's a lot of alerts, but it's hard to know whether anomalies are bad or they just happen to be that way. So what we do is we really train for things that are clearly bad based on what has been learned by the model. And then we try to orchestrate with all the other systems, you know, the ACL groups, you know, the firewalls and so on and so forth. And we give them uh, indications of uh, compromise so they can block the threats that are coming in. Right now, I want to talk about the deep learning. We, we talk about the security landscape and how the security landscape is uh, changing and uh, how to ad address the security. And the tool that we are talking about is the, t the deep learning tool. So we hear a lot about the deep learning and how deep learning is being used in different uh, disciplines and image, we see very, very good results on the image, we see very good results on the speech, many different disciplines. But here we are talking about how we are actually using deep learning for cybersecurity. Before we start, let's talk about the terminology. Okay? We, we keep hearing the terms AI, ML, deep learning. What is the difference? What does these things actually mean? And people use them sometimes interchangeably. But in reality, when we are talking about artificial intelligence, Basically, we are talking about the process of acquiring knowledge and then make a decision based on that knowledge. So we process the information, we acquire knowledge, and we make a decision, okay? To put it very simply, any if-then-else that you guys are writing, it actually make the machine smarter, okay? So that's also give the artificial intelligence to the system that is actually doing that, that kind of process. So AI is this broad term that covers a lot of things that actually happen through the artificial intelligence. Then we have machine learning. The concept of machine learning is to learn from data in mathematical form in order to create a model that use that model in order to make a decision. Okay? So that process that we were talking about, getting the data and get the model based on the mathematical form, that's exactly the part that we are called training. So this is basically the concept that we talk about machine learning. So we collect data, we learn from the data, in mathematical form, and we use that model that we have generated in order to make a decision. And finally, we are talking about deep learning. Deep learning is basically a smaller subset of the machine learning algorithms that remove the requirement for doing the feature engineering. As Sumitra mentioned, mentioned here, feature engineering is the part that was used before when we were doing machine learning. So we have the human in the loop. The human was thinking about what I think it's good for the machine to use, okay? I personally have done it when I was looking at requirements to do, for example, as, as some of mentioned, when we were in Qualcomm and we were using that. I went through the standard pages, read the whole thing, look at the, uh, all available information, separate them, curate them, and say, okay, now machine, please learn from this data. 
you see what is the problem here. The problem here is that I am thinking, and based on my knowledge, the machine is limited from, from what, what's happening here. In deep learning, what we are doing is that we are allowing the machine to learn the perfect representation for the task at hand. So if the task is to separate benign and malicious sample from each other, the machine is actually learning the perfect representation that can be used for this separation. And that's the advantage of the deep learning. The machine actually learns how to represent the data in the best possible form. So our task would be to provide the information, remove the noise as much as possible, and provide the information in as small as possible fine granular data in order to allow the machine to learn from that. Just put it in perspective, when you're talking about the image, what we are doing is that for every pixel that we are providing, we can provide multiple channels of information. Okay? And that's why images are so perfect for deep learning, because when they come, they actually come in a format that can be represented and can be given to the machine, and machine use that information, raw information, in order to find the perfect representation for whatever task it is doing. Okay? So this is the general architecture that we are doing for deep learning. But why deep learning is so important? Why everybody is talking about it? Why it's so dominant? So the deep learning algorithms thrive on big data. Okay? The more data that you can provide to the deep learning algorithm is performance good. But traditional machine learning kind of saturate. They, they don't have much more room to learn. However, the deep learning, deep learning engines can actually get better and better in accuracy as we provide them with more data. We have some discussion about the data. The sheer size of the data is important, but it's not the most important thing. The diversity and the cleanness and the labels and accuracy of the labels and information that you have in the data is actually most, more important. But the more information that you give to the deep learning engine, it gets better and gets better and gets better. The other thing is that these algorithms are good to, tr to actually harness the technologic, technological advance in hardware. So now GPUs are there, huge amount of processing power is there. We are using you know, AWS infrastructure in order to train models using the hundreds of GPUs that is available over there. And the more processing power that you throw at this thing, this thing gets better and better. And that's the important thing. And some of it is actually depends on the simplicity of these algorithms, how, how well defined they are, and how we can actually use this processing power in order to take advantage of them. And these algorithms have enough capacity to actually represent sophisticated decision boundaries. Okay? They have nonlinearity em embedded in them. They can actually find the decision boundaries that is actually happening in multi-dimensional space. And we are talking about hundreds of thousands of dimensions. Okay? Just think, in your, think as uh, humans. We think three dimensions, and then we call fourth dimension whatever we want, time or anything, and then we stop over there. These algorithms actually work in hundreds of dimensions and actually find the decision boundaries in that. And that's the advantage that we have with deep learning. So deep learning finds the best function. So that's the difference, and that's what makes it different. So what happens here is that we are looking for a function that can recognize that, I'm, that image as a cat, or that can find the relationship between the higher and hello, or do the translation. So this is the task in hand. So we are looking with the best, with the task, and we are finding for the perfect representation that we are looking for this process. Then how we do that? We have the training data. Okay. We use this training data in order to find the set of this function, and then we evaluate the goodness of the function that we have found. Okay. This is the loss function that we are calculating. And then through the mathematical representation, basically the, through the gradient descent algorithm that we are doing, every time we move one step closer to the function that actually does the task at hand the best. Okay. Based on the information that we have, we find the direction that we have to move we move towards that direction and then evaluate the function over and over and over. And we iterate over this process multiple times in order to find the best code. So now there are lots of details involved here when to stop, how fast you are going, to, going there, what kind of loss algorithm are you using. And that's all the tiny things that you have to make sure that you get them right in order for your algorithm to have the better performance. And then finally, you see the architecture for a simple you know, DNN structure that you have. You have the input layer. You have the hidden layers, and then you have the output layers. The task that happens in these hidden layers is basically that representation that I discussed. So they are finding the perfect representation that is used for the final layer in order to do the task. So if the task is separating between two classes, it finds the perfect representation for that task. If the task is to find between multiple classes, it finds the perfect representation that is needed for that task in hand. And again, this is one of the major uh, advantage that deep learning has. But is it the solution to every problem? Deep learning algorithm works when we have complex decision boundaries. 
when we have lots of data, and when we have, if we are doing the supervised learning, when we have labels for the, that data, and we don't have too much noise in them. These machines, these algorithms are so powerful. If we provide them noisy data, okay, they simply learn noisy, noisy information, and that's what we get, okay? A lot of people have heard the notation garbage in, garbage out. That's exactly what's happening here. If you feed the information, noisy, info, noisy data, if your labels are not correct, if the size of data, if the data set that you have is not prime data set and very good information that you are providing, the, uh, the machine learning algorithm cannot give you the, per the best performance. Images, natural language processes, and also speech have these properties. We have very difficult, complicated decision boundaries in order to separate the image from, from each other. We have lots of labels and we have lots of data. And these labels are actually keep getting updated and updated and updated. People provide information about the image of themselves now and 10 years ago. That's perfect labeling. So now you can see the transition and you can use that all kinds of that information in order to train very advanced and very complicated machine learning algorithms. The advantage is we see a lot of these similarities in cybersecurity. We have terabytes and millions and millions of samples for the cybersecurity, different malware, benign traffic, protocol, all kinds of that information that we have. The task of the cybersecurity is a very compli complicated task. Sometimes if you start and discuss with your peers and your colleagues, it's very difficult even to decide what is malware and what is not. And if you look at the vendors out there, they can, they can agree on, okay, this particular sample is malware or not, if this particular sample is an adware or not. So it shows how difficult is this decision boundary and how complicated is this world. And then finally, we have lots of labels. All kind of those security analysts, all, those, all, all people, all the rules that we have, all the efforts that have been done, it actually end up for us to have lots of labels and lots of label information that we can use in order to do server security. However, consideration should be made because these labels can be noisy, and that's one of the biggest challenges that we have for the deep learning algorithm. What are the challenges that we have to apply this tool that we think intuitively work actually for deep learning for cybersecurity in order to use it for this task. Detection speed. This is the cybersecurity attack. Remember, you get compromised in less than 83 seconds, okay? So you have, to be, you have to be very fast. You have to make the decision as fast as possible, okay? That means that if you go from, uh, you have to be able to collect the data, you have to be able to process the data, you have to be able to make a verdict in fraction of a second, okay? That makes, that needs a lot of optimization. That needs a lot of, uh, fine tuning to be sure in order to make the models as fast as possible. Noisy labels. We collect the data from different sources. Those labels are noisy. Actually, you easy, it's easy for you to find the same samples in two different data sets with different labels. And sometimes these labels are benign and malicious that far away from each other. You train with that information, that would be very problematic. So you have to find an automatic way in order to actually curate your data and clean your data. The other part of the problem is evolving landscape. We see different kinds of malwares, different kinds of variants, different kinds of new things that come in. Zero days, while well, everybody's talking about them. So it's not a clear cut problem as you can see, okay, if this thing is a table, if this thing is a square, or if thing, this thing is a, is a sphere, it's always like that. These, these definition changes. We see new malwares, we see new explode, we see new kind of very smart way that attackers are using in order to actually await existing uh, detection mechanism. I have a very uh, interesting graph later, later down the road. Uh, I, I, show, I show it to you that how actually the attackers scramble suddenly when they start to get detected in order to come up with a new variant. And then they relax for a few days and then they start to get caught again and they scramble and then they have a new variant. So as long as they can use it, they are very happy, they use it, and then suddenly they start to get detected. They to go modify, use tools that they have, use the, you know, very smart ways that they can come up with, and then they come up with a new variant, does the same thing, but actually evades the detection algorithms. So the threat landscape actually changes. Interpretability, that's also one of the biggest things in cybersecurity and also for deep learning. Okay, we have this model, this model tells something is benign or malicious. What else, what can I do about that, okay? I need to have more information, and especially in security landscape, People are very used to knowing more information. What kind of category is this? What kind of family is this? What does it do? Why do you think it's malicious? Okay? And that kind of information, it's very important for an uh, algorithm in uh, cybersecurity to be able to provide that information. And finally, adversarial attacks. Now using a machine learning algorithm, we are talking about using it for detecting. People can use it for actually attacking. 
Okay? And to be honest, it's sometimes it's very exciting to use these algorithms to see, okay, what can it do? What, how far it can go in order to be able to evade this detection algorithm? And it's, it can be used in many different ways. You, you heard about this adversarial attack that happens on the image detection algorithms with one pixel or few pixels in order to evade the detection algorithms. The landscape is a little different here because the security is always a game. So the ad adversary wants to gain something. That gain may be just to shut down the whole system or delete all the files, but it's still a gain, okay? So that changes the game, the, the, the landscape a little bit because they have to have an application that runs at the same time, evade the detection, and actually give them the advantage. But they still can use the adversarial attacks and they use the AI in order to actually find the new attacks and evade the traditional uh, cybersecurity mechanism. Here we see how we are actually trying to solve those problems. We have the AI pre-trained models. We spend a lot of efforts to curating our data, removing the noise. We have actually machine learning based algorithms to actually look at our data in order to single out the places that we think our, our data are not good enough or we, know, we, don't, we don't have enough data and go after that and make sure that we have data that represent those, those cases in our detection space. We use the ensemble algorithms in order to make sure that we are resilient against adversarial attacks because, well, you may await one, one model but multiple models is much harder to evade. And also, we are working a lot on having the ability to describe why we are doing this. This is the performance that we get using deep learning for the cybersecurity. So here on the bottom, you can actually see different famous classes and families of the malware. Okay, some of them you may hear uh, heard them, some of them you may not, but we have ransomware that actually usually make the news because these are the ones that actually do most of the damage. And look at the performance. Look at the performance, how good we can actually detect these algorithms. One of the other advantages that we have in, cyber uh, in using deep learning for cybersecurity is the generalization. As I mentioned, the landscape is always changing. So we need a model to be able to generalize. So you don't have to update your model over and over and over. So when you're talking to the person in the, in the, in the industry, they are used to know that, okay, their signature things get updated every few hours. Okay? But that's not something that's easily going to be scalable. These models are very resilient, okay? And I have, I have a few examples on how, how resilient these things are actually are, and how good the models are actually in detecting the zero days that we have. In order to have these models and in order to be able to train machine learning algorithms, you need a very fast, capable, and a scalable infrastructure. We are training hundreds of models every day. We are evaluating them based on the data that we have, based on the task at hand, and we are looking for the best model that we can use for every particular problem that we are answering. So here, as you can see, we are using AWS infrastructure, we are using this S3 buckets in order to, to store the data, we are using the RDS, we are using ECR to, to use the containers in order to be able to scale rapidly in order to evaluate our samples against multiple models that we have. And we are using the AWS batch to scale very, very fast in order to calculate the information. One of the most important things, and we spend a lot of time in order to have this infrastructure because that enables our threat team actually to be able to analyze the things that we have, giving us the direction, helping us to understand exactly what, what, what are the points that we have to, uh, to move toward them and improve the accuracy and coverage of the model that we have. And it's actually very useful for us. It takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of manpower to have this infrastructure, but imagine that you have this huge repository of the models. Every time that you have your new data set, you submit it into the infrastructure, automatically it scales, it do evaluation, and it gives you the result. This is what happens when you are training a model. We have different samples, benign, ransomware, so crypto miners, and the information is still us. Imagine, these colors are the labels, at the beginning, if I take the labels away from you guys, you couldn't separate them. But now the model is trying to find the perfect representation we projected in 3D in order to do the separation, not only the benign and malicious, but also among different categories. So this model is also capable of telling what kind of category this malicious sample is, if it's a ransomware, or if it's a crypto miner, or if it's information is stiller. Look at this example. That black dot that you can see over there, that black dot is actually a grand crab. This is a ransomware. And you see how close this is to the red, red patch over there. This is basically how the model can actually evolve, uh, evolve into the things that it hasn't seen. So this is similar to the video that we see, but it's actually about the emotet that Somita was talking about. 
On the right, we have the feature space before training. You see the red, which is emoted, yellow one, which is different, ma different malwares, and the blue ones. If I take away the color from you guys, then here, separating the blue from yellow is not an easy task, okay? And if you do it by randomly, there's a good chance that you actually make a mistake. Once you are training your model, the model changes the representation to what happens on the left, on the other side. Huh? So what happens here is that you see that the blues are talked out on the, on the right side of the, side of the graph. And then yellow ones, which are malicious ones, but they are not emoted one. actually, they are gonna go on the top side. And then you have the emoted on the bottom side. So basically, this is exactly what model is doing when it's training. It finds the perfect representation for the task that you want it to do. It separates things for you to define the categories in the way that the data is presented to the model. And we talk about the generalization. This is about an Otobo. This is the ransomware that shows in early January. Okay, and this is the graph on the virus total. What happens is that you see that since the time that it was submitted to virus total, this thing is actually takes more than a day for people to actually scramble and get more information and actually start to detect that thing. So for, for more than a day after submission, this thing was not even well detected by many vendors. And then suddenly people started to detect that. It took it full four days in order for this system to actually get to concessions and people agree that, okay, yes, this is a malicious thing. So that means that you have a lot of time for the attacker to actually attack the system and spread around. Our uh, state of the art model immediately detected that when we presented the, the malware to that. The most important thing is that the models that we have trained six months before that or seven months before that also were capable of detecting that things. And that thing didn't even exist at that time when we were training the model. So thank you very much.